Half a day students, I am Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. You all have been through a year of big changes. We've had to adapt and make big changes to keep our families and our island safe. But with change comes opportunity and a chance to try new things like PBS University. While Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenori and I will continue to do our part to keep our island safe, you students have a part to play as well. Your part is to keep learning and to keep up with your lessons. That's why I am happy to see you here ready to learn with PBS University. PBS University is a way to bring a continuous educational curriculum to you while you stay safe at home during this time. To help you keep up with your studies, we asked our friends at PBS Guam and the Guam Department of Education to put together this episode. Thank you for doing your part and have a great lesson. Humanities Guan, an independent nonprofit organization affiliated with the National Endowment for the Humanities, is dedicated to promoting public humanities programming for the people of Guam and providing foundational support and educational resources for our island community. For more information about Humanities Guan, visit www.humaniesguan.org. The following webinar series is part of a project presented by Humanities Guan entitled Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Pataguan. This project explores tomorrow's stories, experiences, and perspectives on civic engagement in relation to voting rights, democracy, political status, and tomorrow self-determination. Unincorporated consisted of the five-part webinar series that took place from January through May 2021 and covered topics on the origins of tomorrow self-determination, the work of the Commission on Decolonization, the relationship between art and decolonization, and the role of the U.S. legal system as it relates to Guam's political status. The project culminated with the launch of an online and printed magazine distributed throughout the community, which consists of essays, creative reflections, and artwork exploring issues around Guam's political status and decolonization colonization through the perspectives and historical and political experiences of the Chamorro people of Guahan. For me, I was trying to recreate a scene that I remember very well in my grandmother's living room from when I was a child. And so I almost wasn't creating for an audience. This was something that was sort of therapeutic in a way for me. And, and it was just something that I wanted to produce that almost didn't matter if people liked it or not. But I do think that nanas in our culture are very special. And so people have really responded to this film in ways that I didn't expect. I wanted it to be a comedy because I, I'm not sure because my grandma has passed away. So I don't think I could do a very meaningful nostalgic film that didn't have comedy without breaking down and crying on set or something. So yeah, I'll go ahead and share this next clip. <laughs> And I wish I could share that whole film with you. I, I love it. Alan Certeza, who is also a Chamorro filmmaker, or his specialty is in camera. He really was able to capture the feel that I wanted. And then Dr. Judy Flores was generous enough to allow us to 
take everything out of her house in, in Arahan. And she allowed us to work in there and produce for four days. So I'm really grateful to her for that. And we ended up with a really authentic feeling because of the kind of wood paneled housing that we worked in. But I don't want to take up too much more space, but thank you so much for allowing me to share some of these pieces with you. Thank you very much, Ms. Flores. Those are really wonderful. Uh, so, so far for the audience, we, we see two very different styles of artists, uh, both Chamorro, but uh, with uh, Mr. Castro, of course, we saw uh, paintings of landscapes. And then with Ms. Flores, we see her working in film. So, so what we're, what, what we see just at least in those two examples in the, the bodies of work that the two artists so far have presented is that one, we have a variety of mediums and then we have across the spectrum in terms of uh, whether something is more active or is more passive in terms of having a social agenda. Uh, we see two, we see very, in those two particular examples, we see a kind of shift, right? In Ms. Flores's work, we see a more direct kind of a social agenda to the type of work that she does in film. And uh, with Mr. Castro, we see uh, that more nuanced and we see that more subtle uh, in the work that he does. So our third panelist, also another fantastic artist, uh, Miss uh, Carrie Ann Ifit Naputi Borja. Carrie Ann Ifit Naputi Borja is the daughter of Anne N. and Robert C. Borja, Familien Caderon Zendasu. She is an indigenous Chamorro woman with roots in both Guam and Saipan an educator, community organizer, photographer, and creator of body uh, ornamentation, currently living on unceded uh, Chochenio Iloni land, uh, otherwise known as Oakland. She works as uh, an ethnic studies teacher in SFSUSD and a lecturer of Pacific Islander studies at San Francisco State University. Uh, she is actively involved in Guahan's decolonization movement as co-chair of the OD Committee in Independent Guahan, Bay Area Chapter, and through various mediums in which Carrie Ann uses to create the focus uh, has always been the promotion, protection, and perpetuation of the Chamorro culture, which she holds sacred. Carrie Ann, the floor is yours. And Masi, um, for having me here and allowing me to be in the space to talk story and share. Um, it's really great to speak alongside Rick and Kara, and then also to see a lot of the folks who are here as well. So I started carving in 2009, and I wanted to show specifically this picture of this is Moms, aka Mama Jill, aka Julie Kitsitsu Beneventi. She is a master of body ornamentation amazing carver, amazing spirit, soul, like everything. And I started carving or apprenticing under her in 2009, which I was super honored uh, to be able to do. So I definitely wanted to start it out with her just to kind of give honor and respect to who it is that I owe what I do to, right? And so even to this day, I still continue to apprentice under her. I've been apprenticing under her for 11 years now and I will probably continue to apprentice under her because I don't think I'll ever truly know um, all that there is to know with carving even though I have carved and created through various mediums and various forms. The other photo is just kind of of me and my set Lu Ken who also apprentices under moms just stay at the center at Segun Couture and Samoru which is where I spend a lot of my time at when I'm back home. And then just a sample of kind of like how I come up with some of my pieces which I will show you and um, share some of the stories around it. So a lot of it's sketching. And then from there, I kind of start to create some of those pieces. As I mentioned, there's a lot of different materials that I carve with. I wanted to show this first one, which is spondylus or the spiny oyster shell. One, because it shows you a lot of the different colors. Many, the more valued one, of course, is the orange one that you will find often. Also the shell that you find a lot in a lot of our ancestral burial sites when they are dug up due to hotels or even dug up due to the military, right? Particularly currently right now going on what's happening up north. So orange is one of those ones that are very special for our people, but they don't only come in orange, right? There's the candy stripe ones, there's the pink ones, there's the orange, there's the different gradient ones, um, which you can kind of see in this image. But I wanted to show this photo specifically because the piece if you're looking at it to the left, which is kind of like a pinkish, whitish one, that was actually the first piece that I ever carved under mom's. Um, I had met Mama Jill in 2008 over the summer, and it was when the they were having the Pulan Festival up at the 
cultural center. This was before we had doors, before we had windows at SKC, before the gate was even there. And I remember I kind of just kicked it with her and talked story with her. And I had mentioned to her that I had found some shells and that shell actually is from Tinian at Taka Beach. And she had offered to teach me if I wanted to learn. And so the following year in 2009, I actually went home to do my research for my thesis in my master's program. And it was then that I asked moms like, hey, can you, you know, you still down to teach me? And she was. And so I basically spent four months every day, Saturday, not Sunday, because Sunday we would be up to the center and I would carve and I would learn the different ways in which to create. And so that's my first piece that I ever did. The piece to the right is actually a Marlin bone hair pick. Also has spondylus. There's a spondylus money bead in the front that you can see and then behind it as well. There's also three pieces, which is a gatsai or an ads, a tupa, which is the sling stone, and then the lati. And so this hair pick basically represents wealth, right? Prosperity. It represents uh, creation through the ads because the ads is what is used to create. The tupa, the sling stone is protection. And then the lati is strength, right? Because that's the foundation of our, of our ancestors' homes. And then the marlin, of course, represents the ocean. And all of it represents ocean. But that was a hair pick that I created in 2016 when I was invited and given the opportunity to produce and create a piece to be submitted to the Te Papa Museum in Aotearoa. This one right here is a bone piece. And I kind of wanted to show you a little of the, like, the progression of how a piece kind of looks. I think oftentimes when you see pieces, whether or not you see them adorned on somebody, if you see them, if you go to Chamorro Village or if you go up to SKC or wherever, or even if you go to a store and you see some piece, especially if it's made by an artisan and truly handmade, right? You, all you see is the end product. You never really truly see the steps that it takes to create a piece. And while the end product, of course, is beautiful, there's also beauty in terms of creating that piece. And so this is a little thing as terms of how it kind of goes. It's more just kind of coming up with some of the ideas. Like I said, I do a lot of sketching. I have some sketchbooks that I sketch into and come up with designs. So it's sketching, then you carve it on out. And then from there, you sketch out your pattern and then you essentially etch it on in, which is one of the the skills I definitely learned. So it's not just only carving, it's also etching different patterns and whatnot. This piece is actually a neck piece. Ms. Morhara, can I just uh, interrupt really quickly? And, and I just had a question on, as you're speaking into these pieces, what relationship does your art and these kind of materials that you use have with aspects of decolonization? I mean, first off, just break down the word like decolonize, right? The purpose of colonization is essentially to erase a culture to destroy it, to have it not exist anymore, right? Like that's what happens when colonization comes through. It's definitely something that has come to go on, right? In terms of first the Spanish, then the US and the Japanese and back again to the US. And so if part of that purpose is to erase a culture, our body ornamentation, what I create, what other artisans also create, whether it's carving, whether it's film, whether it's painting, whether it's weaving, it's all perpetuating our culture, a culture that shouldn't even technically be around because of the fact that we are not meant to be existing at this current moment, right? You even look at what's currently happening right now with the military, with what's getting built. Us having these pieces and rock, like wearing these pieces, whether it's a godlafen, a sanahi, even just earrings, right? Bracelets, whatever. It continues to show people that we still exist, that we are still here. It is in and of itself a form of decolonization, again, because we are not supposed to be here. This is not supposed to be existing. And then also it helps to perpetuate our stories, stories oftentimes that can be easily lost, stories that are oftentimes not found within our classrooms all the time. Granted, now recently, within I guess maybe like the last 10, 20 years, it's starting, our stories are starting to be more prevalent in the classroom. But prior to that, it wasn't allowed in the classroom, right? Not even the language is allowed. And so when we see these pieces, at least for the pieces I create, there's always stories behind it. There's meaning, there's symbolism, right? Like with that hair pick, with the money bee, with this piece right here, the lati again being a symbol of strength, right? The weaving pattern was the weaving of cultures because this person who commissioned me for this piece had learned a lot about different cultures in Oceania. She worked at an exhibit out here in Oakland that I got to be a part of for a brief moment. But she came to really like have a lot of respect and honor for, you know, just kind of learning more about Oceania and the different Oceanic peoples found within. 
And so for her, this piece was made. And so there was a weave, that weaving pattern is the coming together and the weaving of cultures and peoples. And then the three dots represented a creation story. It's three. So it would be Ponten, Fotna, and Chaifi, right? So when I give these pieces, the stories always come with it. And the pieces that I create are usually, they're made after I kind of talk story with folks. And then also sometimes the piece will tell me what to make out of it, right? As much as I want to sometimes dictate and say like, okay, this is what you're going to be and this is what I'm going to create out of you. It doesn't always necessarily work out that way. Sometimes I have to take a pause and wait and figure out like, okay, this is what it's actually asking me to do. And this is what it's actually asking me to create, right? And then when you think about decolonization as well, it's like all of the materials, all the pieces that I'm going to show you, they're all pieces and all of the materials are found back home, whether it's in the ocean or on the land. Right. And I think when Kara had said land is ancestor, ocean is as well. Right. We have so much wealth, like land is wealth, land is life. And I think when we remember all of the things that we can create and all of the things that we have, like we have so much wealth in the land, in the ocean. Um, and I know as a carver body ornamentation, like there's definitely hella wealth on the land and in the ocean. It's where I'm able to get a lot of my materials. And so this, for example, this is Ifit, one of the strongest woods back home. The piece on the left are Tupat, so again, protection. A lot of the, um, the etching that are on it are based off of pottery designs that were found and documented. The right is an Ifit Sanahi that was commissioned for someone in the States up in Washington. And it's just a simple Sanahi, right? But in and of itself, there's still a lot of meaning. And I believe the person didn't feel ready enough to have like a Hima Sanahi. So they commissioned for a Ifit one. But again, a lot of these pieces, there's different meaning and different stories wrapped up behind them. So this is one, the Gatsai, the one on the right, is one, for example, where it told me how to kind of create it, right? That little white swirl that's kind of in that. When I was carving it, I remember just kind of being like, oh, what am I gonna do? How is this gonna work? What is this gonna look like? And then just kind of sketching and playing out with it, it ended up being how it is, right? It kind of reminds me of a wave, just the angle of it, the way it's shaped. Again, that one, um, these pieces right here are aliling. The top of both of these pieces are Hema, which is the giant clamshell. The piece to the left is a three-dimensional lati. And as you can see, it's the size of a penny. So I kind of wanted to show kind of the size in terms of how big it was. And I had created this when there was like a little competition going on back home among some of us artisans. Particularly the weavers, they were doing this whole challenge where they were like weaving these like hella tiny little birds and katupats and like the size of a rice, the size of a dime. And um, one of my friends we were talking about, and I was like, oh yeah, I was like, let me see if I can try carve this. And I ended up carving this lati the size of a penny, which was, you know, not that big. You could probably pull out a penny and check it out. But it was one of the funnest pieces I ever did. And I tried to get it as true to scale in terms of the, um, the tasa being round and then the haligi, which is the bottom part to be square. And if you ever notice all of the latis, that's usually how it is. The top is round and the bottom is more squared. Um, so this one is hima, which is the giant clamshell. And the picture to the left is a sanahi, which is a traditional piece for men and boys. This piece particularly was a nanny size. It was for my godson, Matlack. And so it was carved. And to the right is kind of a mother-daughter piece. The gulafun is hima. And the top piece, the money, the spondylus is spondylus. For the mother-daughter piece, my sister's top lock is actually from the same shell as her daughter's shell, who's also my goddaughter. But Hema is one of those things is one of the easiest and yet also not also the easiest material sometimes to carve. Like when you carve, you also have to be very mindful of not rushing a piece. You have to be patient with it, right? You have to take your time because it's so easy to easily crack shells or even easily to crack Hema if you're not too careful. And the thing that I love about Hema is that even within it, each Hema piece, even though it may look the same, whether it's a golafun, such as the one I'm wearing or the one in the image, they all have its own characteristics. They all have its own grain. And so there's no two that are the same, even though it may appear to be the same. 
But for example, the Sanahi to the left, if you actually can look at it look close enough, there's little waves and lines on the bottom of that Sanahi. Again, the shell itself determining how I am going to end up creating that piece to be. And this last slide, again, is just kind of one, just wanted to show you a little bit more of like what the process kind of looks like in terms of carving, how it is. And then also some of the pieces, right? These are some earrings that I've made and created. Again, a lot of what I create has meaning behind it. Don't get me wrong, like there are pieces that I create just to create, but many of the pieces that I create have meaning. For example, even those earrings have meaning. The tsupa represents protection. The triangle, or looks like a triangle upside down, is, I call it like a spear tip, so it represents power. The fish represents prosperity. And then the bottom is just a play on the, like a smaller tupa. And then this big piece on the left was actually, is actually one of the bigger, the biggest piece I've actually done. It is all cone shell. There are 13 of them, if you count around the neck. And it's 13 to represent the 13 moons in our lunar calendar, right? In the Chamorro lunar calendar. And this play on this necklace is actually play on um, some of the pottery designs that you can look and see. So not only is it the show, but also the piece in and of itself. The middle centerpiece of this necklace is actually about three or four inches, and then it gets smaller and smaller. And then of course it has the, um, the earrings that match. And the photo on the right is those pieces that I was carving to create this, this neck piece, essentially. So yeah, so uh, again, you know, being able to create, I think is, is something for me that feeds like my spirit and my soul. It allows me to tell stories. It allows me to continuously connect to the ocean and to the land. And as was mentioned before, you know, promoting, perpetuating, and protecting our culture is super important for me. And if I'm able to do it through my creations, then that's what I'm going to do because it's fun. Like to be able to play, to be able to create. We call it play <laughs> up at the center. Like when we do this, Mom's calls it play, like, oh, it's play time, because it's fun to be able to create pieces. Sign of Masi. Sis Masi, thank you so much, Carrie Ann. So those are beautiful pieces, really gorgeous. And, you know, I, I did notice across, just kind of across all the panelists there, there seems to be, there seems, uh, seem to be some common themes that art is personal, that it's a way of telling stories, that it's a spiritual, there's an element of spirituality that honoring ancestors seem to be important, is important is an important element. The connection, the spiritual connection to our ecological landscape, the ocean you mentioned, Carrie Ann, also Ron and Kara both talked about the land and the heavens, cultural pride and empowerment. And I was really curious and totally fascinated by the idea of the body or, or ornamentation as as a way of showing kind of cultural pride, but in the context of decolonization, Karen, how you were talking about it, is it in your mind also, is it a form of, of wearing a, a piece, like say one of your pieces, is that a form of resistance or refusal? So I guess that's a question to you, Carrie, real quick as we, as we start to populate the other questions. And that if all of those very, to me, are very personal elements, and this is for all the panelists, how do you reconcile access? Like who gets to see and experience those personal things if it's stuck in a, you know, in a VIP lounge, as, uh, you know, Mr. Castro talked about one of his paintings, if we wanted to see it, we had to pay like 40 bucks to get into that lounge or something more personal that you wear on your body, like the idea of selling it. You know, if if you got a, if you get a, a beautiful shell in a very a sacred place for you, that's personal. Right. And you find it and then you create something. Of course, the reality is, is that artists have to live. Right. We, we have to pay taxes like everybody else. So how and this is a question for all the panelists, if, if you want to jump in, please. So the question is, you know, how do you feel about the commodification and culture of culture? the idea of owning culture and given all of those incredibly deeply personal elements that, that, that are thematic throughout all of your work, which is variety of mediums, right? Despite the social, the, despite the, whether passive or active social agenda that comes with your work, how do you reconcile those things? And, you know, as an artist, has that changed over time or, or is it, is, is it a fluid process as, as you've evolved in, uh, in making those decisions? Want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I could start. 
These webinars can be accessed on Humanities Guahan's Facebook page. To view the online magazine associated with Unincorporated Voting Voices and Visions Paraguahan, visit humanitiesguahan.org backslash unincorporated. Half a day, students. I'm Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio. For more than a year now, you all have continued to wash your hands and watch your distance from others, and you've done a really great job wearing your masks. We know your parents and guardians have helped you to make these changes to keep yourself and your community safe. As Governor Leon Guerrero said, we are happy you are here. We want you to continue to learn and sharpen your skills with the help of PBS University. This program is the result of a collaborative effort. We couldn't do it alone. I'd like to thank the teachers and support staff of the Guam Department of Education and PBS Guam for their work and their commitment to our students. I'd also like to thank you students for participating at home. To your parents, I'd like to thank you for taking an active role in your child's education. We are all eager to return to a time when all of us can share and study together in person. Until then, we hope you learned something new from this PBS University instruction.